is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Bill Von Hippel, who's the author of The Social Leap and also a professor of, at the School of Psychology um, at the University of Queensland. Uh, he's also an advisor to Toucan, so he has been along on this kind of crazy journey since day one. Um, but he's also incredibly smart, very witty and funny, and I'm so excited that um, you all are going to participate in this discussion with us today. So everybody, please give a warm welcome to Professor Bill Von Hippel, who will now come up to the stage, send, send a lot of um, claps. If you haven't done this before, if you hover over somebody's video, then you can send um, clap emojis. So come on up, Bill. All right, spam, spam with the with the claps. Hi, that's a really welcome. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> We're so happy to have you here. Um, please, if, just to to kick this off, if you could give a little bit of information about your background um, and your research for all who uh, don't know you. Sure. So I'm a social psychologist, but I'm also interested in our evolutionary history. And so I'm particularly focused on the last six million years um, since we uh, separated from our chimpanzee cousins and how an understanding of all these sort of key events along our evolutionary pathway help us get a better picture of what we're like today and, and why we do the things that we do. That's that's not a, a big time frame at all. That's really, you're <laughs> under a microscope. Really. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I just want to kick this off kind of with a really big question and something tells me we're going to be kind of answering this question over the course of, of this discussion. Um, also, by the way, I'd like to tell everybody um, before we formally start that if you have any questions yourself, please put them in the global chat. So down in the bottom right hand corner, um, there is a chat button. Any questions that you have, please toss them in there because I want to make sure that your questions get answered um, first and foremost. But I'll just kick this off. What do you think the greatest psychological and societal impacts are of the pandemic? Coming out of this now, again, we can answer this in bits and pieces as we go, but I wanted to kick it off with a big one. Yeah, so that's, that, that's a great question. And I think that one of the things that we see when we have these big societal changes is there's, of course, going to be costs and benefits, things that work out very poorly for lots of people and things that work out really well. And if you look at the negative side, we see a big loss of learning, um, particularly in among poorer communities and wealthier countries. So if you're in a country that that locks down, like if you have enough control over your citizenry and you're concerned about the pandemic and so you lock down, the we know that school literally increases your IQ and when the kids can't go and particularly the kids who don't have a lot of resources, then they fall behind. And so that's one big thing that, one big negative. And the other big negative that we typically see in cases like this, whenever there's these big economic slowdowns is people who that should have been the peak of their career. That was a moment when they're really taking off. If everything slows down, sometimes when you track those over time, they never get back to where they would have been. So for example, if you had the bad luck during the Great Depression in the 19, 30s, you know, starting the bank crash in 29, if you had the bad luck that that was right at the point in your career when you should have been taking off, and now we look back at you, your earnings will never be the same as, a, as the cohort before and after you, because you just lose this really important time period. And so um, those, those are typically the biggest negatives that we see, but at the same time, those negatives are offset by two wonderful human features. Um, one of those is our incredible capacity for innovation. So when things like this happen, you know, Toucan's a great example, right? You guys come along and say, well, I'm not happy with the way we're able to socialize. Let's see if we can do something better. And so tons of innovation has come about that, that changes the way that we think about not, not just product innovation like this, but but also social innovation, the ways that we integrate with each other, the ways that we socialize, the ways that we do our work. And the um, I suspect the, the biggest plus of all of that, it's kind of remarkable and it seems bizarre and silly, but it's the gain in self-knowledge. And so 
you know, when, when something like this starts, we, we, we're creatures of habit. We, we've been following a plan that we set a long time ago. We, we, we don't always give it thought. So a good friend of mine is a lawyer. And when he got sent home, he was like, okay, I can do that from home. And over time he realized, I really, really hate law. And when they asked him to go back to work, he's like, I just can't. And he didn't, if every day he'd been going, he wouldn't have realized that he just can't anymore. And now he's a running coach. And so it's this, you know, complete change, right? This awareness of what is making you happy and what's not making you happy. And I think that's part of where that great resignation came from, that lots of people were doing things that they actually don't like. And it wasn't just work things, it's also social things, et cetera. And so that gain in self-knowledge and the innovation that we see are probably the two big positive sides that come out of all this. I think that's that's really interesting. And I've actually had a question that's well related to the kind of self-knowledge bit that you just mentioned. I think I've noticed this about myself, but I've also noticed this about my friends and my family. There are some people who came out of COVID realizing that, okay, I really can't not have human interaction. I really need to be with people all the time. That's where I get all of my energy from. And then there are some people who say, Actually, I really never need to be around people ever again. Like I need my alone time and I'm really happy knowing this about myself. Kind of what do you make of that? And how do you think that's going to impact how we socialize moving forward? Yeah, that's a great example because what, what's happened in the case like that is you've learned something about yourself that you didn't necessarily know because we're all in our in our pre-COVID world, we all go to school or go to work every day and have these face-to-face -face interactions all the time. That's just what the world is. It would never occur to anybody, I don't want to do that because in other words, you'd be stepping out of the world. And now suddenly we live in a new existence whereby you can step out of that world. And so my wife, for example, is a little bit shy and she loves to go to workout classes, but she hates the beginning part when she doesn't know people, the milling around where you're kind of making small talk. And, and when COVID came and all that could go online, so there's no awkward part. You, you jumped onto your yoga class or your bar class online and you just turn your camera on when time starts. She totally loved that. And she's you know, doing classes twice as much as she had ever been before. And so the, the, the change, this, this massive shift online provided a real opportunity for lots of people who had, there were little tiny bits in, of their social existence that they didn't like, but previously were unavoidable. And now they're entirely avoidable. And then for the other side of the coin, like you mentioned, it drove people nuts who are high in extroversion and just needed to be around people all the time. And although, Look, it's way better that, that that happened now in this internet world where we could have this e-socialization. If, if it had happened when I was in high school, you know, every house had one landline and, and that was your only contact to the world, right? You'd all be lined up by the phone trying to call your friends. It would have been a disaster. So the, the fact that we could do it now is, a, is, is way better than it could have been. But it's still, I think lots and lots of people realize that e-socialization is not enough for them, that they need to get out there. And, and also they need to supplement it with physical contact. What do you think the role of virtual communities is moving forward? Because there is this drastic shift where that was all we had. And now people are kind of overcompensating in the other direction and saying, oh, you know, frantically trying to to do things in person but they might be missing an opportunity or are they on to something what do you what do you think there so so these these e communities and particularly ones like this where there's some flexibility in the way you socialize you know the we use zoom a ton for work when i teach and things like that and they're very regimented and social life isn't regimented like that there it's it creates an un, an unpleasant barrier that people don't want but but social platforms like this, where you can noodle around and you can just do what you want, they go a long way towards supplementing our everyday interaction. But in the world that we live in, it's still very much a supplement. What, what the data suggests is that peop if people replace their direct physical interaction with, with e-interactions like this, then it's psychologically costly. But if they supplement, it's a psychological benefit. And so, for example, in the pre-COVID world, um, my old college roommates and I basically never got together and mass. We would call each other or email each other, but we never got together as a group. 
And then in a post-COVID world where we all started doing e-cocktails and you know things like that, our group started getting together again regularly, just all together on one platform. And so that's a clear case of supplementing, right? Otherwise, they live thousands of miles from me we, and each other. We don't see each other at all. Now we get to see each other regularly. So in those kinds of cases, um, these e-communities are a massive plus. And when it comes to work specifically and the workplace, everybody's been talking about hybrid and what that's going to look like because we want to be accommodating to people with different schedules and different lives and different degrees of extroversion. How do you see that playing out? And specifically, when it comes to people who work from home, what is it that companies need to do to make sure that they feel that sense of belonging? Yeah, that's a great question. And and it's tricky in several ways. Um, first, it's obviously, a, there's a lot of big pluses to this hybrid version of work. I mean, just the, the, the sheer time you save not being in a car or a subway or something like that is is obviously a big plus for, for your company and for you, because um, it just creates more time in your day. The and, and as these kinds of platforms get better, where you, you can shift around, it allows companies to disperse themselves all over the globe and it allows employees to disperse themselves all over the globe. And so you don't have to live in in a town that you didn't particularly want to live in just because the company you really want to work for is there. And that has, of course, enormous benefits. It, it means that companies with, with lousy work cultures no longer have a captive audience. They no longer have people who are forced to work for them. And so they need to up their game and become a more pleasant, friendly place to work. Um, and so there's, there's big pluses in that regard. Probably, though, the biggest risk is Incidental contact is super duper important for humans. And you can think about this in the context of all the ideas that you've ever had across your life that changed what you were doing or that made whatever you were doing better. And lots of those are a product of systematically sitting down with somebody to solve a problem, but lots of them are not. You're in the coffee room and you're making yourself coffee and somebody else comes in who you don't even talk to that much and purely out of politeness, you start to chat. And then somehow a shared interest comes up and you realize they know something that you don't know. Um, and they can help you solve a problem that, that they've known all along, but you didn't even know that they had that information, right? And we call that the strength of weak ties. It's this idea that the people who are closest to you, you tend to share what they know, but the people who are a little bit farther away from you, you don't know. It's this unknown unknowns. And they, they don't tend to come up unless you're in just random chit chat, because the whole point of an unknown unknown is that you don't know you should ask. And so companies need ways for employees to incidentally contact each other. And you can imagine one way to do it would be platforms like this, where people are kind of asked to float around and come and go in different kinds of contexts. I have to admit, I, I've never properly worked for a living, so I don't know what I would do as a company to push that happening in an e-space, but it's super important and it shouldn't be left behind. Um, there is a question that we have here from Ken. Um, and he is asking, how do you feel work cultures are going to exist in the future? And will remote work make it easier or harder to change? So I think remote work is going to become increasingly important. And I think that the key thing about remote work is going to be to allow people the flexibility that they, you know, some people probably only need to re work remotely. And so I work with a guy in Amsterdam who's in machine learning. And, you know, you most of the, there are brief conversations that are necessary, but mostly he then goes off and does a ton of coding and comes back to you, you know, a day, a week, a month later with an answer. It kind of doesn't matter where he lives. And if he's the kind of person who is happy in his own life, like he could go into a coffee shop and do it. He could be home, he could do it. You know, it, it allows him enormous flexibility and I don't actually need him there. But of course, there's lots of kinds of contexts where you need people all gathering together and sometimes even physically gathering together to do one thing. And so I would say that probably white collar work is going to become much, much more flexible. But but naturally, the physical work, the blue collar work that lots and lots of people do, well, that still requires in some way that you go in or that you drive that bus or that you move those products or whatever the case might be. It would be interesting. One consequence that I suspect will come of this is that we'll see another wave of automation where lots of jobs that, that companies are just really struggling to hire someone to do now because they people realize they don't like doing those jobs. They're going to get automated and there'll be a whole new class of jobs that will replace them. But I'm, 
I don't know. That's just a total guess. Okay. On um, on the topic of work, still something that I'm really intrigued by because I'm seeing my friends go through it um, is that young professionals now have a really different workplace compared to older professionals. And so coming into the workforce right now and having everything be very remote and in this kind of state of flux where nobody knows what things are going to look like in a couple years or even just a couple of months. Yeah. Um, how do you think kind of those young professionals are like should go about this and and do you think that it's taking a toll on their professional lives um kind of well it certainly forward. can and the, the main thing about coming into a company and and the same holds almost no matter where you work is that you need the people around you to see you as mission critical and you need to have them know what you can contribute to the company and you need for them to be able to see your opportunities for growth and for you to see that and one of the ways that that traditionally happens in companies is all sorts of informal mentorship relationships that typically happen across age groups where the older man or woman takes you under their wing and says oh you need to know not just you know where the where the, the good coffee is or something like that. But you also, here's a set of informal rules by which we operate. And when you when you enter a new space, you don't know um, the sort of modus operandi, the standard procedures that, they, that the company typically engages in. And one of the things that companies benefit from is young people come in with different ways of doing things, and then they slowly shift the corporate culture in good directions, and then they absorb the, the ways that the company was already doing it that were themselves quite good. And that can be much more difficult when you're kind of in this isolated e-world. It's, a, you know, an isolated e-world is like the most negative things about cubicles, but an interconnected e-world where, especially if a company is conscientious about linking people up to mentors who've been there for a while, about allowing you to let people know what your skill set is so that they can start to see where your value lies. That's the kind of thing that would, that would prevent these sort of problems from really stymieing integration of new people into a company. So if you could kind of break the effect of the pandemic up by generation, are there specific generations that you think are most affected or everybody obviously has been affected in different ways, but are there any really prominent ones? I mean, we've talked about young people, we've talked about people at kind of the pinnacle of their careers, um, but others. Yeah, I think, if I had to guess, I would say the pandemic was hardest on young people and single people who didn't have, especially if they're not really well to do, who struggled to find good social relationships. And so when you look at interviews, you know, one of the ways that we can understand what's going on is is by just looking at huge societal trends, but a lot can get lost in that. And so, and then you look at these sort of individual life history stories and they ask people how they responded. And what you see over and over when you do that is that young single people who were looking for romantic partners and or older people who are single again in life and, and also looking for romantic partners often found that well, the partner I have is pretty ordinary. It's the last person I was dating and we weren't really a good match but at least I know them and I know that neither of us has COVID. And so it was, it's sort of sad, but you kept seeing people going back to kind of cruddy relationships that they knew weren't great for them because it was all that they had, right? You can lean that you could do before. You couldn't do a lot of the things that you could do before, particularly people who had health concerns and were worried that COVID would really strike them down. So lots of young people weren't worried about COVID at all. And, and at least to the degree that they're their particular location allowed them, then they could mingle and life was a kind of slightly or crummier version of before. But for those folks who were either really worried or, or were in cities where there were hard lockdowns, it was, it was really hard on people who were by themselves and were looking for relationships. Because of course, that's lonely as all get out. I mean, old folks like me uh, who are married and you know, kind of content not doing much anymore, it, it barely mattered. But, but for lots of people, it mattered a lot. Um, what do you think we will, what do you think the effect of the pandemic on kind of dating and not dating for a long time? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a big one. I mean, the thing is that if you look at people who've 
been married or been in long-term relationships and then they get back in the dating pool, they always say the same thing. Like, oh, it's so hard to get back into it. It's hard to dive back in and, and there's some excitement to it that, that's not there when you've been in it for a long time, but there's also a great deal of difficulty. And I think that the pandemic will have done that as well because it forced mo tons and tons of dates online and, and it forced people away from the, you know, in-person kinds of ways that we typically, I mean, look, relationships are starting much more online than they ever did before. And, and an interesting when they start online to be the best relationships and this that had accelerated for example among homosexuals that had accelerated much more rapidly than it had among heterosexuals because it's of course easier for heterosexuals to start new relationships because they know full well that the probability of the person that they encountered in the bar has the same sexual preferences that they have but for gay people it was always a lot harder because there's risks when you do that and so there are places that gay people often went where they knew most everybody else was interested in a relationship but far quicker than than straight people gay people had started using online as a way to meet and so it's a great starting point these kinds of platforms are a great way to first meet somebody and to see if you might be compatible and to do all the initial first steps but of course eventually you want to get together in person and covid made that super difficult for lots of people um, just a, a question kind of more broadly about mental health, because somebody, mm -hmm. somebody texted in the, in the group chat, and I'm very curious about this too. Do you think that the pandemic has actually led us to take better care of ourselves or what, if anything, do you think the pandemic has kind of illuminated when it comes to mental health? So the, the pandemic, we lots of people predicted all sorts of terrible outcomes that mostly haven't come to pass and so the mostly it's been people who um people who have opportunities and have some kind of um you know that if they're if they have the economic wherewithal they were able to do an awfully good job of taking care of themselves by and large often because you know by eliminating things like the commute and by eliminating things that gave them more time in their day they could then you know, still very self-consciously use that to, I'm going to start meditating. I've been talking about doing it forever, but I'm going to learn how to do it now because they literally have the time to do that, right? And so mm -hmm. it's been a lot softer on people with the economic wherewithal who weren't worried about how am I going to afford my rent? How am I going to afford, um, you know, my food? And, and, and then it's been, so, so in some ways, those people have actually, benefits is a strong word, but they've actually done come come through an awfully well mental health wise and some have actually benefited and then the, the downside is it's been an enormous struggle again for mostly for the um the poorer people in richer countries because in, in a country where they don't even attempt to do a lockdown they don't even attempt to change the way they're living because it's just it's just not possible then those things don't change that much people just get a little bit worried but in in countries where there's lockdowns and then you're on the poor end of the community there you're really stymied yeah and so that's been the, those people the mental health we've seen more problems and and you know the lots of things tend to to go through um there, there's contagion almost so for example when i was a kid if you look at the self-harm side nobody ever it was super duper rare for somebody to cut themselves to self-harm and now that's really common and and we see an acceleration in in that sort of thing um, up leading into and in the pandemic itself as well. And that kind of goes around through social contagion. So the internet can spread things way faster. And when most of your socializing is on the internet because you can't socialize in person, it spreads even faster still. Right. Um, I'm going to kind of shift this back mm -hmm. towards work because we have quite a few questions coming in. Um, Hamad, if you were able to come up on stage i would love if you would ask um your question you would just need to press the orange button um down at the bottom of your screen the one that says present and you can come up on stage with us and, and ask if you feel comfortable um if not i can ask your question for you perfect perfect Oh, am I? Uh, is that right? Yeah, uh, that's how you yes. do it. Right? Hi. Yes. Okay. Hi. Okay. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, basically, uh, my question is mainly about, for example, you know, uh, in inclusivity. Actually, okay. I was uh, looking at a 
a documentary very recently that apparently that it was showing uh, they were the premise that oh the reason that actually managers or even employees actually like people to be coming back or like them to be in the office as such the office space or what do we call it that they think that you know what if the office space it really helps your career somewhat which i actually disagree with that but at the same time i think uh, because of the pandemic yes i think uh, now that uh, a lot of people are working from uh, like a hybrid uh, doing a hybrid work okay but uh, the before the hybrid i think uh, things were get, getting better in terms of inclusivity so for example uh, people with disabilities and uh, people with different sort of requirements yes but the thing is that so because now as things are opening up and a lot of managers are getting a little bit frustrated that people aren't returning back so i think the thing is uh, my fear is that there might start to be some uninclusiveness starting practices going on again so i was just wanted to get your views on that yeah that's a great question yeah, that's because a great question oh, i'm getting weird oh, okay there it stopped um it that's a great question because in fact the what makes a workplace effective in person is if everybody's there who needs to be there right and so right now my workplace um i, I teach at the university of queensland most of us are going in maybe two days a week and so what that does mean is that the days that i go in hardly anyone else is there and then that can create its own self-perpetuating problem whereby what's the point of going in because the people i really need to talk to aren't there anyway and so i'm in my office and then i'm on electronic messaging with with people around um, you know zooming with my colleagues but i'm in my in the office and so what you want is a, an environment where everybody feels welcomed and and it feels inclusive exactly as you say but you also want an environment where then there's easy interaction between people. And so what companies are gonna to need to do is find ways to make their teams coordinate their activities with each other. And of course, we're in a, in a pre-COVID world, nobody would have balked at the notion that you're expected to be at work when other people are expected to be there. And now people have these, these expectations in contrast that they have a great deal of flexibility. And well, the team, my team wants to go on Thursdays, but Thursdays I prefer to work at home. And, and how do you resolve those things? And in the end, that's what companies are gonna need to figure out. How can we get everybody back in a way that, that makes everybody feel welcomed, but also has the people there who need to talk to each other. And as I said earlier, it's not just, you don't just want the marketing team in one day and then the engineering team the other day, because those two folks at some level need to also interact and have cross pollinate on occasion as well. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for companies is finding a way to coordinate that kind of both that hybrid work. The next question, Ken, if you want to come up onto the stage and ask your question, um, I think it's a good one. I can also ask them too. Okay, perfect. Hey, so hi, Ken. So really, hi. Hey, thanks for coming on, uh, Dr. Bill. So of course. really my question was was around mentoring. And when, when we're talking about the newer generation coming into this work of all things, how do we set up mentoring? And what do you think the answer going to be over time? Will this have helped or will it have hurt us? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the thing is that mentoring relationships are super important. And they also typically tend to emerge com somewhat organically. And so your company could say, Ken, you're gonna be Bill's mentor, but then it turns out that either we, maybe we get along fine, but we just don't have that much in common or whatever the case may be. And what really ends up happening is that you become the mentor to that other guy to the right, and I find a mentor for that other guy on the left. And so the, the beauty about face-to-face -face is that it allows that to develop on its own, that I keep running into you in the coffee shop, in the coffee room or or when I'm trying to solve a problem on my computer and I ask you to come over, and it's much more difficult to do that electronically. And so I suspect that the, the kinds of platforms that we're on right now that has this sort of flexibility that allow people to move around are gonna be our best bet to deal with this. But companies are gonna to need to find a way to allow the, this incidental contact, to allow this incidental request for help. You can imagine, um, you know, buttons that you could put on, like let's say that we're all working at a, at a manufacturing company you could imagine buttons that you put on, I'm a little confused about why we're following this procedure, or I don't understand 
how to do the next step that you could somehow, it's a little bit of a version of raising your hand and then you would see my hand up, so to speak, and you'd see what the question, you could hover over me and see the question, you could come over and help me. And if you could do those, if, if, if companies can set up these kinds of electronic platforms that allow that flexibility in, in, in soliciting help and, and providing it, I think that we could get to the same point that we were naturally, which would be me knocking on your door repeatedly. Hey, Ken, I can't understand how to do this. Sorry to bug you again. And you're like, yeah, you know, no worries. I'm happy to help you straighten that out. And then I avoid bugging the person who scowls at me every time I interrupt them, right? And I, so I, I think that's what's going to need to happen is that we create these kinds of, you know, flexible ways of of integrate of indicating that we have a problem and that we need help and that we and and that others can see and then can provide that kind of assistance. I wonder I'm curious to know whether people are going to feel equally comfortable kind of asking for help in an entirely remote world versus an in-person one and i'm not i'm not just talking about the tools and what we can do and what buttons we can we can add where but just psychologically if, if there's a closeness um that you get from kind of being in person versus being virtual yeah. and and connecting in that way well the one thing that, that we have seen that surprised me is that you know, I, for example, I teach a huge lecture class with 300 people in it, 350, and people don't like to raise their hands often because they're worried, my question is stupid, I'm going to look like a fool, I'm going to slow the whole class down. But they, I found that this, the exact same people who are unwilling to raise their hand are super willing to put in a chat box, um, I don't understand what you meant when you talked about the standard deviation of whatever, you know, some statistical question that they were otherwise worried they might look foolish. And so I do think that there's way, being online can actually... <clears throat> can actually make it easier for you to ask some kinds of questions sometimes, particularly if they're questions that might otherwise be embarrassing. And so you you want to be able to have these mentoring relationships where you can go ask difficult questions, ideally of the same couple of people who you know know the answer. But if you just have these sort of very general questions, the advantage of these chat kinds of functions is that you can you feel like you're minimally disrupting and that anyone can answer. The downside being, of course, if nobody ever answers your question, you can feel kind of ostracized and left out but in mm -hmm. in principle it should be a plus um andrew has a follow-up question to that which is do you think that that's because they're more comfortable off camera yeah lots and lots of people are more comfortable off yeah lots of people are more comfortable off camera because you don't draw as much attention to yourself and also the beauty is imagine that you know there's a chat box and and I have a question and I start to type in and I see, well, 14 other people have that question. It's really validating. And so one of the things that we found that the internet has done is that if people worry that whatever their questions are, are stupid, they worry their predilections are weird, they worry about all those kinds of things. And when you can just type them in a chat box without having to be seen, and then you see other people have the same exact concerns, it makes people feel a lot better. Yeah, I think, I think that that makes um, perfect sense. What about, so there are a lot of different ways that, that people get together. There's kind of say Discord and Discord is just a, a bunch of text. I mean, it's not just a bunch of text right. for all Discord fans here. I know there's more, <laughs> but um, meeting people just through text um, and establishing relationships like that what's your perspective on on that and um like is there any research on it um anything that we're that we're seeing happen you know with with friendships made online like in that there's some huge pluses to that um one of them is that we start to find that the thing is all of us have had the experience where we initially meet somebody and we may not even find them very attractive to us. And then as we get to know them and we get to know their personality, they just seem all the so much cuter and more interesting and, and even potentially attractive to us when they seemed unattractive before. All of us have had that experience. Um, coincidentally, by the way, women tend to show that effect more than men because men are arguably a little shallower with regard to appearance. But nonetheless, we all show that effect. Um, and so the, um, one of the big advantages of meeting online is that you you get to watch this, you get to find that you are simpatico and that you've got a lot in common and you've developed this fondness 
before you even ever see them or start to interact with them. And so the positive qualities that are there by virtue of the personality match already come into play. And I suspect that's part of the reason why relationships that start on the internet actually tend to last longer and lead to more satisfaction than relationships that start in person because they've got a lot of people already have a lot of things in common. The one advantage of text only also is that it allows you to avoid the social faux pas that people often make when they accidentally, um, like imagine that I'm surprised, you tell me something about yourself that you're a little embarrassed about maybe, and I'm surprised, I don't, I'm not offended, I'm not bothered, but I didn't know that. And I go, I make this face. And then you go, uh oh, I told Bill this embarrassing thing and he's appalled, but I'm not appalled, I'm just surprised. And that happens a lot, and, and especially in new relationships. And that's a lot of the awkwardness of blind dates and things like that. And the beauty of text only is that that's completely eliminated. And so you tell me this weird, embarrassing thing about yourself. And I go, oh, that's a surprise. I say to myself, but I don't say that to you, right? I just type, that's cool. Um, you know, my my cousin um, Vinny is the same way or, you know, whatever. And so it, it allows us to avoid the kinds of misunderstandings that actually can take place in person. And so there's a lot of good evidence that, that relationships can actually start smoother online and particularly interestingly, sometimes if they start out text only. That's, that's really fascinating. I haven't thought about that before. Um, Michael Chan, if you have a question, I see that your hand is raised. If you wanna come up and ask a question, then hit the orange present button at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to hear it. But sometimes people raise their hands for fun. I know I do. <laughs> Super fun. And I can I can, uh, can keep moving forward, but Michael, if you have a uh, question and wanna put it in the chat, then please go for it. Um, what, for everybody who doesn't know how to raise your hand, hover your mouse over your own video, and then you have a couple of options. And the one all the way on the right is to raise your hand. Um, so something that I'm curious about is that people tend to get extremely nervous when it comes to online anything. And I think that that's reasonable because you want to be safe and there are a lot of dangerous things on the internet. But you know, one thing that relates to me specifically starting Toucan is that people who use traditional video conferencing tools like Zoom or Google Meet or, or Teams are so used to having total control over everything. Um, I think and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I can imagine that part of these people's minds are is saying, this is not a human way of interacting, therefore I need to exert as much control over it as possible. When on the flip side, what we're building with Toucan is trying to just say, hey, remember the stuff that you did naturally because we're human beings? What if we told you we, you can do that online and you can just move yourself and you can have um, you know, conversations in groups that make you comfortable. And a lot of people are quite resistant to it because they're so used to kind of clenching onto to control for dear life. What, where do you think that is coming from? And do you think that the way that we approach online tools is going to change as we get more and more used to it? Or is this as used to it as we're going to get? Yeah. Well, I do think we'll get more used to it, but at the same time, if you look at classic theory from organizational psychology, they you, you break the world into quadrants, and, and often the way you can divide the world up is that you've got competing quadrants. And so, for example, there's classic theory from the 1980s that talks about a process orientation, which in your terms is kind of control, setting up a whole bunch of rules that they govern exactly how things work. And then the opposite quadrant from that is creativity and innovation. And the problem is that it's it can't be avoided. When you push on one, you diminish on the other. And so if I create a lot of rules and control, then I'm diminishing just of necessity, creativity and innovation. It's just less likely to happen. And then the same happens if I really emphasize creativity and innovation, well, I'm giving up on control and things aren't necessarily going to go as I want them to. And so you're going to have platforms that are really well designed for process and control and you know, putting everybody in little quadrants and and everybody you you 
who can speak when and all those kinds of things are nicely worked out. And those probably work very well under some circumstances, but they're going to massively limit the innovation that's going to emerge, the creativity that's going to emerge, and the spontaneous things that will bubble forward. Whereas platforms like this one that are much more about, um, that, that give control to the individual participants and allow people to kind of do whatever they want, they're going to be great for creativity. They're going to be great for innovation. But if it, it's imagine, you know, like the, if the analogy is going to war, this wouldn't be a great platform for going to war because I'd be like, where are you guys? We're all supposed to be together. And suddenly I'm all by myself. You want people kind of marching side by side. And so in the end, what I suspect is going to happen is that two things will emerge. One is people will go to different platforms for different purposes. Like, oh, this is a great place to brainstorm and to meet people and to talk. But it's not a great place if we all have exact jobs that we need to get done and we're doing it. Alternatively, you have platforms that allow themselves to both shift in process mode and control and things get very regimented and then shift back out and to be free flowing like it is right now and here. And so I think things are going to go both ways in that regard. But no, we have a long way to go before we're totally used to it. I think that, I mean, you're probably way more used to it than I am, but I do think that in general, it's that as the quality of it gets better, it gets easier for us to get used to it. And as you have more experience, doing it, it just becomes much more natural as well. Um, Lois, do you have a question? I see that your hand is raised. If you want to come up um, to the stage and ask. Oh, hand went down. OK, totally fine. Um, uh, something that I, I'm curious about, too, as a, as a young person, I don't have kids. But I can imagine that this um, this pandemic and the experience that we've gone through is going to have long term effects, not just for people who are alive now, um, but people who are to come. And how do we see kind of traumatic global events like this affecting kind of future generations psychologically, even though they weren't really around to see it? Yeah, I think that one of the ways that they affect it is that there's long lasting consequences of these really, what I would call big experiences. And so the pandemic is a big experience for almost everybody. You know, here in, in Queensland, where I live, it was one of the littlest experiences it was anywhere in the world because all we did is shut our borders and then we went about life as usual. So it was like, oh, you can't travel internationally, but otherwise, no one's wearing a mask, people are going to shops, people are going to public events because there was no COVID within the country. But almost the rest of the world didn't have that experience. They had constant either lockdowns or nervousness or whatever. And and that can lead to some permanent changes in your philosophy or your personality. And so we know, for example, that generations who went through the Great Depression became very oriented toward um, security and how do I make sure that I don't find myself without enough to eat again? And how do I make sure that my investments don't suddenly disappear? Like I'd rather have the money in something you know tucked under my bed so I could at least get it than in a bank that fails or in a stock that crashes. And so it can lead to big differences in life approaches. And then subsequent generations just think it's weird. They're like, why is Nan putting all her cash under the mattress instead of in the bank where it belongs or instead of in the stock where it'll actually grow? And so yeah. the my guess is that the subsequent generations are going to just think we're weird. And when we tell stories about what it was like during the pandemic, it, they're going to be like, that's so bizarre, but it's over now and you got to get on with life. And, and so <laughs> um, I, I suspect that this won't be the last pandemic. I mean, the problem is that as our world becomes more tightly integrated, you know, it would have been the case 50 years ago that uh, flu that originated in, or, uh, you know, something like COVID that originated in a small town in a country like China, maybe would never percolate forth. But now there's so much rapid international transit that it's going to happen again. And it, it may not even be very long. And probably one of the big benefits that we're going to get from it is that economists love to study what they call exogenous shocks, which are something happens that's independent of the person, and then people respond to that. And because so many countries responded differently, we're going to have great data about what 
worked in the long term and what didn't work. And so things that look like they were terrible idea in the short term may turn out to be great ideas and vice versa. We don't even know yet. We have to wait until five or 10 more years have gone by and then we'll see, well, what was the human toll? What was the financial toll? What was the psychological toll? And all those questions have yet to be answered. Once we know the answers to that, we can do a better next job next time. And, and with luck, will prevent them from being anywhere near as bad as they were. And kids really just will regard us as weird when we talk about it. They won't think, oh yeah, and I've had to do that four times myself. Yeah. When one can hope. Um, um, Lois, if you want to come up and ask your question by clicking the orange present button, then you should uh, be able to come up unless you're on a phone or a mobile device, then, then you can, oh, I'm perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I oh. unmuted before and I was talking away and then you're like, oh, she put her hand down. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, you got to present so everybody can hear you. Got it. So first of all, thank you for hosting this. Obviously, it's my first time in Toucan, um, but in particular, the topic uh, in general. Um, bunch of things to say, but my specific question a uh, little bit of background. I'm the director of an association for 18 post-secondary institutions across Atlantic Canada, been around for 60 years. They have these various um, discipline specific conferences once a year. I've been working as a digital nomad for 20 years with this. So, you know, pandemic happened and now everybody's in my playground, right? Instead of them seeing um, thinking of the Science Atlantic as this organization where they meet people once a year. Science Atlantic exists 365 days a year. Awesome. However, we are having our first in-person business meeting in November. That's going to be 18 deans of science and a division head from each discipline and so on. And travel is an issue. It's a very small People are not rich. Traveling to this is not research related. It's it's service related, very university uh, focused. So they want us to do, they want us to organize hybrid. Um, we just did a strategic planning one day session last month. We had seven people in a room and five people online. The facilitator who I've worked with before told me it was the most exhausting facilitation she had done in 30 years. You know, we were trying to do breakout groups and do flip charts and the the tech people at the university didn't know how to set things up. And and, you know, I wasn't physically I, I wasn't hosting it. I was attending it. Somebody another university was hosting. Anyway, all of that to say, I'm really quite concerned <laughs> that this is supposed to happen with with. Um, uh, faculty members who think and expect that events can happen in a hybrid fashion, but they're not actually doing effective hybrid fashion classrooms. And I'm not even a, I'm not a, I'm an administrator. I don't teach. I don't, I don't do any of this stuff. So anyway, I am, I am scared to death. In a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. Look, hybrid is super hard. And the key is that right now platforms are mostly designed to either be in person or to be online. And it's super hard to integrate those two. And I think that it's gonna require two things. One is that a very conscious thought on the part of the platform providers, what can we do to make the experience more seamless between people who are in person and people who are, aren't, who are not? And secondarily, the technology so that they are right there and kind of in your face for the folks who are in person, because otherwise there's some little screen off in the corner and the, the folks who are online get forgotten and lost. You know, it's just, it's a nightmare in 47 different ways. Yeah, I've been that person going to these council meetings or conferences virtually for 20 years. Um, the funny thing is, is although I'm working with this large group of people, my concern about making sure that we do all this is sort of getting, oh, it won't be a big deal. And I don't have a tech person. I am, as I say, I go and attend something that's being hosted by a school. And they're just like, this is not high on their priority and yet. Anyway, I know that I'm I'm sort of babbling, but I think you're preaching to the converted to me. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. 
Well, look, it's a great it's a great question because what you want the the next big step is going to be for platforms like this one to think more thought to, to give more thought to the problem. What do we do when we've got these hybrid conferences? How do we integrate those two better? And yeah. um and, and it's a super important question and it's one that's largely been ignored because we shifted from all in person to all with the exceptions of people like you who've always been as you say a digital nomad, we've shifted from all in person to all online, and now we need to shift to something in between. And and as you say, as the coordinator, that it can be really hard if, to try to get people to talk together. But it also, this is a more reason for innovation for Antonia and the crew to come up with a way to make Toucan work better for people who are in both situations. I am I am super happy to be a guinea pig. I will do anything you like me to do. Um, I just it's very important to me to see this. Um, it's a grassroots organization. You know, our, our budget is $150,000, even though we represent 18 post-secondary institutions, and I'm the only part-time regular staff person. Um, so, you know, it's really important to ensure that these deans and faculty members can interact effectively in this limited, you know, 36-hour period I have them for, yeah. of which they're yeah. not all gonna be in the room. Well, grab to grab Antonia and tell her what do we what can yeah, we do to make this thing awesome. Having Thank you very we, much. Can, we can take it offline. Um, we can we can definitely meet separately about that because I I'd love to hear about yeah. your situation and the event Thank you. a little bit more. Thank you. So thank and you. Bill, I think because of your academic background, you can probably also picture all the all the rest of the complication of, of yep. the faculties yep. and universities. So thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks, Liz. Nice to chat with you. Um, I kind of I want to have one more question um, for you, Bill, before we move mm -hmm. into just kind of free flowing. People can hang around. Bill will hang around for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. People can ask questions, kind of in a in a smaller um, setting. I kind of want to drill down a little bit more into innovation because it's kind of extraordinary how in a time when everybody was locked in their houses it was actually one of the most kind of fruitful uh periods in terms of innovation kind of how does this compare to the past and and what does this mean for how we deal with problems in the future i think that's a really really broad question but I'm curious. No, it's, it's a great question. And the thing is that there's really the, you know, we tend to think of innovation as um, a brand new cool piece of technology or implement. And so this is, Toucan is, is a great example. We think, oh, you guys with a bunch of engineers, you've invented this new platform and I could never do that. Like I'm not an engineer. I don't even know how any of this stuff works. And so it just seems so beyond me. But in reality, all humans are innovative. And the, the main thing is that what we tend to do when we're innovative is we tend to innovate socially. We tend to say, all right, well, I've got this problem that I faced. How is it that I can leverage my friends and, and colleagues and things in order to come up with an answer to this problem that I'm facing? And what's so interesting is that the what the pandemic did is it, first of all, created, of course, a health crisis. And most of us aren't dealing with that at all. I, I'm not a microbiologist. And so it's there's nothing I can do to, to create a new vaccine. And so I don't even think about that. But I, what I can do is think about, well, how do I get to live the happiest life that is the most productive and that still allows me to see my friends and do my work and things like that? And that's where I think all of us have been socially innovating and we've been trying out new things. We we um, say, well, I've got time for yoga. Let's see if I like it. I've got time to, and so we we not only just try new things, but we also try to find new ways to have fun with each other. And so um, as a, for example, I, I mentioned earlier how my roommates and I all now get together on a regular conversation, but it's also the case that my sister and I, um, now every you know weekend evening, we call each other and we do the crossword together. Remember, um, I think we even were able to rope you in on one of those. And so, yeah. um, the it allows you to start doing things that that are just fun that you just weren't even thinking about doing before and we don't that that seems trivial but it's not actually it it fundamentally changes the way that you lead your life and so those social innovations those kinds of ways of having fun you hadn't thought about before you can then discover there's things that you really like because 
you never tried them. We, we don't know ourselves very well. We, we think we do. But it comes back to the point I made at the beginning. We're creatures of habit. And so we often just do things because we've always done them. And then when somebody throws us a major curveball like the pandemic did, it has enormous advantage that it can get us to try new things. And then lo and behold, some of those new things that we try turn out to be really great. Well, I think that is the perfect note to end on. Uh, thank you so much again for coming to speak with us. And I will reiterate, you'll be here for a couple of minutes, floating around, chatting with everybody um, who, who has any leftover questions. I'll also be floating around to talk to you about Toucan. I can't tell you anything about social psychology. I wish I could. But um, really, seriously, thank you so much for coming in and speaking with our community here um, and sharing your wisdom. We always learn so much from you. So of course. Thank you very much to everybody. To a round of applause. Send them all of the claps. Um, <laughs> and please go find Bill um, in this space and go and join this group to tell him how much you love him. Yeah, Thank I'm you so much. Chat with everybody. <laughs>